I hope this session is going to be um, quite practical and, and straightforward and, and helpful. Um, I'm going to emphasize some services within West Grade and Compute Canada that I think are the most useful humanities and social sciences subjects, especially those services that offer what I like to call a, a short on-ramp to using the, the National Com Canadian High Performance Computing Grid. Um, and these are services that you can take advantage of with, with little or no technical expertise, which is, is why they're great. Um, throughout the talk, I will also emphasize, probably ad nauseum, that the first step to using Compute Canada um, should be to come talk to one of us, myself, um, the Humanities and Social Sciences national team, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, you can tweet me. I tweet now. Um, and I'll, all those addresses will be at the end. Come get in touch um, for more personal consultation on how you can get started. Um, so I, I won't be giving very specific walkthroughs of technology today, but I hope that this introduction will get you thinking more about how you might be able to take advantage of the, the national resources in your own work. Um, so sort of basic outline uh, of what I'll talk about today. Um, I'll give a brief overview of what West Grid and Compute Canada actually are for, for anyone unfamiliar with um, who they are, what they do, and how they help research. Um, I will introduce you to um, the National Compute Canada um, Humanities and Social Sciences team and how um, this national group can, can really help you specifically working in humanities and social sciences. Um, I'll then move on to some specifics about how you can get access to Compute Canada resources um, through uh, what's called the resource allocation competition. Um, and then how to apply for an RPP. What is an RPP? What, is, what does that mean? We'll talk about it. Don't worry. I'll leave you in suspense for now. Um, and then I'll talk about other services and resources available through Compute Canada as well. These are some of the, the smaller but really helpful um, sort of targeted services that you can, you can use um, when you become part of Compute Canada. Um, and at the end, I will showcase a few projects which are using um, a lot of the different resources available through the resource allocation competition and others to just give you a better idea of, of what's possible for your own research. So what is uh, Compute Canada um, for, for those of you unfamiliar? Um, Compute Canada, it's a not-for-profit corporation which is funded through the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, CFI, um, Major Science Initiatives Fund. Um, but the large um, digital research infrastructure, such as, as Compute Canada, is also about the people um, who work for the organizations. You see from the slide, over 200 um, experts. Um, there are people who look after the hardware systems, administra systems administrators, and there are also people like myself who help users on how to maximize the benefit that they can get from the hardware and software and services and platforms that are available. Um, and Compute Canada is largely about the research community as well. Um, the infrastructure will respond to the needs of, of the community. So the more researchers in the humanities and social sciences that we have um, joining Compute Canada, using the resources, and feeding back what you need to people like me, the better we can tailor those resources for you um, so you don't get eaten by the physicists basically. Um, the more people we have, the, the, the better these services can be tailored to the, the specific needs of humanities and social sciences. So who can, um, the, who can join Compute Canada? Um, any CFI eligible universities in Canada, including research hospitals and colleges. Um, the, the members currently, uh, the U15 institutions, other research intensive universities. Um, Compute Canada's governance model is unique, um, combining a federation of institutional and regional consortia with a national organization which reports to an independent board of directors. Um, we have two independent committees to support activities of the board as well, um, and regional partner organizations are observers. Um, so what Compute Canada does, and I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more, um, is to better allocate the always and ever so scarce funding dollars, um, and to provide researchers with seamless access to infrastructure and resources nationally um, so that researchers in Victoria, for instance, um, can access um, HPC resources in Quebec if they need to. Um, and also to enable 
the advanced research community to have a single strong voice um, nationally when dealing with um, science ministries and funding councils and, and that sort of thing. Um, so Canada's advanced research, uh, Canada's advanced research computing platform. Um, so over the next several months, and, and it's going on right now, Compute Canada will be renewing and consolidating um, its, its digital research infrastructure by consolidating data centers, prov uh, the provision of new cloud resources, and the development of new high performance computing systems. Um, therefore, because all this new stuff is coming online and there's a lot of, a lot of um, flux in what's going on, it's a great time for humanities and social science researchers to start exploring what Compute Canada has to offer um, and to help feed back what would be most helpful for your research. Um, and although the t this talk today is mostly going to be sort of, we built it, now you come. Um, we, we also want you to feed back to us what you need um, so that looking forward and as new services are coming online, new systems are coming online, we can make sure that those systems serve the widest research community possible. Um, so as you can see from, from this, this lovely graphic um, that I did not make, um, the Compute Canada consists of a number of different elements distributed across the country, um, networked and connected by the National High Speed um, Network Canary, um, and sort of together through a system of regional, part, regional partnerships. Um, the, uh, and, and these regional partnerships consortia um, make up Compute Canada. Uh, you can see the map here of, of the, the four different consortia um, and where institutions are. Um, so the, the regional networks and Compute Canada all work together under a sort of Compute Canada umbrella. Um, and having a Compute Canada account, consortium account, you can still work nationally, but um, the <coughs> there's sort of a regional, and I'll, I'll describe this a little bit more about what the importance is between having the national umbrella and also these regional um, organizations. So the regions um, coordinate local activities, such as the training that you're doing today, staff management, and ensuring needs of institutions and provinces are being met. Um, they're also very good for giving a, a, a local flavor um, to, to the support, so that if you go to the um, West Grid person at your institution, they will have knowledge of, of what all is going on nationally at Compute Canada, but also um, the specifics of your institution in terms of um, who you need to talk to about data sharing agreements or research ethics boards, for instance, um, and what other, what other resources might be available at your institution, who you might collaborate with. So the, the regional consortia really um, help with that local knowledge um, that people at each institution have and can develop um, relationships with individual researchers at their institutions. Um, nationally, Compute Canada plays a, a leadership role on, on national scale activities like um, some large CFI funded projects which span multiple institutions across the country. Um, Compute Canada um, coordinates the resource allocation competition, um, which I'll speak about later, um, procurement of hardware for national systems, um, partnerships around research data management um, and other national services, securing funding, um, advocacy on the national and international um, stage. Um, so there, there, there are specific roles for each of these regional organizations and also Compute Canada that all work together um, to, really, to, to really accelerate um, research. Um, now, what does all this really mean for humanities and social sciences? Um, so uh, you can see from this chart where the little black pie um, slice uh, that we are not an, an insignificant part of Compute Canada. It, it's, it's a large group um, and very active group of, of humanities and social sciences scholars using Compute Canada resources. Um, in 2015, I believe it was the fastest growing part of Compute Canada. So our disciplines have a voice in this national stage and we have a large voice and we have a growing voice and we should use it. Um, 
to, to make sure that, that this research infrastructure serves our research needs um, as well. So drilling down a little bit more into um, what sort of specific support is available for humanities and social sciences. Well, it starts with the humanities and social sciences national team. Um, so Compute Canada employs one full-time digital humanities expert, John Simpson at the University of Alberta, and me, sort of a quarter-time full-time DH experts. Um, there are also a number of systems administrators and visualization experts and others um, who volunteer to be on the humanities and social sciences national team. So we're uh, a, a voluntary team within Compute Canada. We meet every couple of weeks and discuss um, training initiatives and coordination in initiatives to help HSS researchers um, across the country. Um, we discuss um, researchers who have come to us for help and brainstorm on how we might be able to help them. Um, if someone from Montreal comes to me to ask for help on something, I can then get them in touch with the humanities social sciences person at their home institution so they can get some more personalized help. Um, and we, we also invite researchers to come attend our meetings and, and talk about what you do and how your research might benefit from, from the resources. Um, we also sponsor a number of courses at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute at University of Victoria. Uh, last year, the two big courses were um, cloud computing, uh, so using the Compute Canada cloud for digital humanities work. Um, and apologies for using digital humanities. It's a bit of a shorthand for humanities and social sciences, everything. I don't want to exclude anyone. Um, there was another course in big data for, um, for humanities. Um, and then uh, a couple of other smaller workshops. Um, we'll be sponsoring courses next year. I think there'll be one on multimedia as well. Um, I'll be giving a short workshop on research data management um, practices. Um, so there are also DH-related training courses uh, as part of um, the software and data carpentry, which is sort of a bootstrapping program to get you um, to, to get you using the command line, get you coding, um, get you understanding the real nuts and bolts of, of how your computer can work for you. Um, and uh, John at the University of Alberta especially has, has designed um, some data sets and some training specifically for humanities and social sciences data. Um, the fourth one, new research portals for DH scholars. Um, this is something we're working on with some staff changes. Um, it might uh, start going a little bit slower, but we're starting to look at how we can build um, platforms in the Compute Canada Cloud so that somebody with a cloud account with a couple of easy clicks and very little knowledge can get an Omeka instance or a WordPress site that they can start to use and test to see if it will work for their, for their research. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little later on. Uh, so, um, how do you get started with all of this? Um, the first thing to do is to visit ComputeCanada.ca and, and sign up for an account. Um, I won't run through the specific registration process because it would take a while and it's all, it's all laid out very carefully on the website. Um, <clears throat> and there are lots of resources to help you um, with getting an account and getting started on the systems. Um, and it, it gives you a nice walkthrough of how also to get an, a consortium account and a cloud account, all of which are slightly, slightly different. Um, so who can, who can actually get an account on Compute Canada? Um, so any faculty member at a Canadian institution of higher education, including librarians, um, can apply for a Compute Canada account as a PI, for instance. Um, but what's great is then you can sponsor um, your graduate students, your postdocs, you can sponsor colleagues at other institutions. Um, so if you have a, a, an international research team, you can sponsor them so that you can all work together um, using, using the Compute Canada resources and it really helps um, uh, it helps to foster collaboration. Um, so one PI from a, from a Canadian um, faculty or librarian can then sponsor, sponsor other members. 
Um, so visit ComputeCanada.ca, email support at ComputeCanada.ca to, to set up a consultation with, um, uh, with one of our experts on, on how to get started using things. Um, and number two here, receive confirmation of your rapid access service. Get started experimenting. So what is the rapid access service and what is this resource allocation competition, which I mentioned briefly earlier. So the resource allocation competition, or RAC, um, is, um, is, the, is the major way in which the finite resources on Compute Canada are allocated to researchers every year. Um, so I'll cover briefly the major resource competitions and move on to some of the smaller services and resources. Um, we'll end up looking at some examples of projects that are utilizing the full range of available tools so that you can get a better idea of who some of our researchers are and what they're doing with, with Companada. Um, so I'll start out this bit just a little bit glasses half empty. Um, the resources that Compute Canada have are finite. We only have so much. Um, and so that's why we have a competitive mechanism for allocating those resources through the yearly process called the Resource Allocation Competition, or RAC. Um, this chart here gives you a, a, a sort of a brief overview of the different parts of RAC. So everyone needs to get your inner pirate on because there are a lot of R's here. Um, and best to keep this in your mind because there are a lot of R's. It can get a little confusing. But I'll talk about each one of these briefly and give you some idea of what you might do with resources in each of these categories. I'm then going to focus very specifically on the research platforms and portals because this one is particularly um, useful for humanities and social sciences. Um, so some, a couple of slides of general information about the resource allocation competition. Um, basically, what you want to know from this is that um, when you sign up for a Compute Canada account, your rapid access service is available immediately. You can start using that immediately. But for the larger competitions, um, as you can see here, they open in uh, early October, closing in November, um, which seems like a really short timeline, but it's not so bad because the, the applications for resources are, relatively speaking, lightweight. Um, there's no money involved, so you don't have to go through your Office of Research Services or anything like that, um, and we can help. Um, so more information about all of these, of course, is available on Compute Canada website, um, and please do get in touch with someone. If you're curious about any of these, you want more information, you want to imply, um, come to us and, and chat about what you need and, and, and what you want to do. There are also some very helpful information sessions um, coming up. Um, this, this page is, is on the Compute Canada website as well, so you can register in, in English or French um, or email rac at computecanada.ca. Um, and these will really give you the walkthrough of um, what, um, what the RAC is, how to apply for it, also get in touch, have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with someone. Um, if you go to one of these information sessions and then have a one-on-one -on -one consultation session, that might help you to formulate the sort of questions you want to ask, like how many core years do I need, how many virtual CPUs, how much storage, I'm not sure. Um, one of these, plus talking to one of us, will, will hopefully help. Um, and I have my email address and, and, and things at the, the end of this presentation. So that's kind of a basic rack. So we'll start at the top and sort of go through the different types of, of um, racks. So we'll start with um, the Resource Allocation Competition Rapid Access Service, RAS, which is every bit as dynamic as it sounds, RAS. Um, so this is what, what used to be called the default allocation, but it's, it works a little bit differently now. Um, RAS is for small jobs, short jobs, will you just be storing something for a short period of time, computing something over a fairly short period of time, storing smaller data. Um, for probably most of, of the sort of data sets um, and, and computing that, that our community works with, um, a lot of them can be satisfied by the resources available through Rapid Access Service. Um, 
So the, the, the takeaway here is that you don't need big data to use the high performance computing. You just need data. It, it doesn't have to be massive. Um, it can be complicated. It doesn't have to be. You can be the longest of the long tail of researchers and we can still help. Um, uh, so as, as you can see, there, there are three different sort of flavors of rapid access, compute, storage, and cloud. Each flavor is a little different, um, and there, there are very detailed information about all of these on, on the Compute Canada website. Um, so as a humanities or social sciences researcher, what can you get out of RADS? Like I said, it doesn't matter if you have big data or not. Um, let's, but let's say you've got a big data set in R. Um, which uh, you want to run some R on. Um, it's, you've got a CSV file and you want to run R on it. It's gumming up your laptop. Well, you could use one of the all-purpose clusters or you could spin up a VM in the Compute Canada cloud and run your R Studio in it, um, thus saving you some time and some sanity and not gumming up your laptop for a few days. Um, with the proper licensing, um, you could uh, spin up a VM and run ArcGIS, which is notoriously slow on laptops. Um, there are four different flavors of, of storage, depending on the type of data you have, how long you need it to be stored, what sort of performance you need. So if you are wanting to share a large data set with a colleague, this might be a way of, of putting it somewhere and your colleague can take it down. There are other ways of doing this too. Um, perhaps you would like to build a test instance of a, an Omeka platform or a WordPress that you want to test out to um, host your research or, or have an online exhibit of something for instance. Um, you can use a, a bit of cloud to test it out, see if that's what you want. Um, and so RAS is, is really good for these sort of smaller jobs. Um, but let's say you want to scale up. You want to develop your platform to, to handle very large data sets, like, for instance, everything ever written by a Canadian author or every Carbon 14 data set available online on the whole world or a new publishing platform for data on research about Indigenous studies. All three of those examples are actual projects using Compute Canada resources. So if you want to scale up, then what you probably want to do is apply for um, one of the bigger R's. So the first step, of course, come talk to one of us. Let's see what we can do. Um, and I was asked as a, as a courtesy to remember if you, if you don't need a VM anymore, if you don't need what resources you've been using in, in the cloud or, or on Compute Canada, shut them down to make sure that the resources are still there for others. So if you want to scale up, where do you go now? Um, there are, said in the, the, the rack, there was the RRG, which is Resources for Research Groups, um, which is basic high performance compute and storage. Um, fairly straightforward, um, popular with the sciences. Um, but uh, the one that I want to really talk about is uh, this Research Platforms and Portals, the RPP. Um, so it was created to, uh, for a number of different reasons, um, to enable communities to develop projects that improve access to shared data sets, enhance existing online research tools and facilities, or advance national and international research collaborations. Um, so some examples here might be resources requested on behalf of a large community of, year, of users that will be reallocated to individuals or small groups. Um, applications that provide a public platform that will make use of Compute Canada computing or storage. Um, groups engaging in international agreements to provide multi-year computing or storage solutions based in Canada. Or groups that are providing shared data sets accessible using third-party interface. Okay, cool. What does that mean really in your day-to-day -day life? So, there are two different Sorry, I keep using the word flavors, but it sort of works well. Um, two different flavors of, of research platforms and portals. You might guess one's a platform, one's a portal. Clues in the name. So with the service portal, um, it, what we look in here, web portals which serve data sets or tools to a broad research community. So you go and you get some tools that you can throw a bit of data at and they'll do a little bit of analysis or some smaller data sets that you might um, might want to download to do your own analysis on your laptop. 
Um, they don't require larger compute or computer storage resources. So these would be fairly, fairly modest, um, fairly modest web portals, really, of the, of the kind lots and lots of humanities and social sciences researchers use. Um, they often use the Compute Canada Cloud, and they needed static IP address because you need your website to be your website. Um, so the compute and storage, the platform, um, uh, these have served significant compute and storage resources to a community of users. So this is where, um, say, every carbon-14 date in the world might be stored, um, or every book ever written by a Canadian author ever anywhere. Um, those sorts of very large data sets. Um, may include a user-friendly front end that submits traditional batch jobs. So it'll just look like a website, um, but it's running, the back end of it is, is running on the HPC resources. Um, so these are larger than, than the portals, uh, 50 core years or 50 um, vCPUs and virtual CPUs in the cloud, or at least 50 terabytes of storage. Um, so these are larger projects. Um, if you want to apply for an RPP and you have no idea how many core years or virtual CPUs or storage or even what those terms mean, um, come talk to someone um, because we can, um, we can help. These are some of the questions that will be asked when you're applying for these. How much storage do you need? How much compute do you need? How much memory? Um, we can help sort of talk about your research, talk about what you want to do, and kind of untangle some of these some of these questions. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that that's the basics about rack. Um, so it's sort of small, bigger, and even bigger. Um, but with all of these, um, depend. It doesn't matter again how big of a data set you have, how much compute you need. There's there's something here that can help you, and um, and and in, in a stable national um, infrastructure uh, that you know will be there and that will that has experts behind it to help guide you along the way. Some things we can't do, we can't build your platform for you. You, you will need to do that. Um, we can help you get it running on our systems, but, but a lot of the, the front end and then the back end work, that, that will need to be done by the researcher. Um, so we can't do everything and, and we do have finite resources. Um, and so it's very important to come talk to us about what your needs actually are, because when you apply for an RPP or an RRG, um, you're not guaranteed to get every bit of what you've asked for. And so it's good to go into it knowing that, okay, this is the minimum I need in order to do my research um, and to, to really understand what your needs are to make sure that they fit within what's available um, on, on the Compute Canada infrastructure. So I'll move on now to, um, to other services. How else do we help researchers? So these other services are, are, are my kind of some of my favorites um, because they don't require a lot of technical expertise. They're quick and easy, um, and they can be very, very extremely helpful, um, more helpful than they might seem um, to researchers. So some of these own cloud, um, a dedicated managed server offering data integrity and 50 gigabytes of space across multiple devices. What that means is own cloud is like Dropbox, but not in the US and so in violation of all kinds of data sovereignty. It's a Canadian based Dropbox like easy to use um, storage platform. Um, you, when you get an own cloud account, you get up to 50 gigabytes. Um, that can be expanded on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what you're going to be using it for. Um, and where this, where OwnCloud has been particularly helpful for researchers um, are people doing field work. So they're out in the field, they're uh, conducting interviews, they're doing archaeological field work, they, they're collecting data and they want to store it somewhere apart from the piece of hardware that they have with them that could very easily get lost rained on, destroyed somehow in a desert, lit on fire. I've heard of this happening on archaeological digs where the equipment tent gets burned down. So OwnCloud can be very helpful because you can keep your data somewhere safe. 
in the cloud um, and a cloud that's in Canada, that's at Simon Fraser University here in BC. Um, and then someone else at your institution can then pull that data on and put it somewhere else. So it helps you with, you know, data integrity and making sure that uh, your data doesn't get lost. And so a, a couple of groups at UBC here are using own cloud um, in their field work. And that's worked very well. Um, but it only works for sort of smaller data sets. You only get 50 gigs. Um, uh, there's also Globus file transfer, which is just a plain old sort of old fashioned FTP, except it's huge and can transfer terabytes of data. So if you need to get a huge data set to a colleague somewhere else, Globus can help you. Um, and it's it's takes a little bit more expertise, but it's not too bad. We can help you. Um, portali port portalize portals for specialized data and tools available for research disciplines like Jupyter Hubs. Jupyter Notebooks, great way to, um, to learn coding. It's not scary. It's not a command line. And Compute Canada has um, partnered uh, with Pacific Institute for Mathematical Studies to offer Jupyter, um, Jupyter Notebooks as a service, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, video conferencing, what we're doing right now, using video. Um, it's a very good collabor collaboration tool, works better than Skype, um, free through Compute Canada. It, it, it's a small service, but it's hugely helpful. Research data management. So as the Tri-Council funding agencies here in Canada start insisting on research data management plans being part of a, a, a wider funding application, Compute Canada is partnering with um, national organizations here in Canada to help make that easier for researchers, help make your research more open and discoverable. I'll talk a bit more about that too. And software distribution. Um, we can help install software on our systems if you need it for your research. Open source, yay, proprietary, a little trickier, but come talk to us that we can figure out either how we can install the software you need, either on our systems, how we can get you a, a virtual machine spun up in the cloud so that you can install the software to use, um, or whether or not there's another software package that might serve your needs, which already exists on our system. So there's a lot of, a, a lot that we can do there. Um, expertise, um, consultation, that's the big one. We will sit down with you. We will talk about your research. Um, we will figure out which systems are the best for you to do. Um, designing, optimizing, and troubleshooting computer code. But to a limited extent, yes, we can't, we can't develop your research software for you, but we can help you with making sure your code will work on our, our systems. Um, customizing tools, making sure that stuff actually works with our stuff. Um, installing, operating, maintaining advanced research computing equipment. Um, if, and this is a particular one with CFI, if, if you have funds to buy a server, um, then you can get one that can fit into a Compute Canada sort of system. We can help do the maintaining um, of that equipment, um, but it's still yours to use. We have a visualization specialist who is excellent, um, who runs a lot of training courses. Um, and is always um, keen on talking to researchers about how visualization can take your research to the next step. Cybersecurity, um, that's a big one. Do I have privacy issues? How do I keep my data safe in this world of scary hackers? Um, what do I do to ensure that, that I am following all the protocols for data privacy and security in, in my province um, in Canada? We, we can help with that. We can help with that. Training, like this. Um, lots of webinars, very helpful, lots of documentation um, through the international, through the consortia, the regional consortia and Compute Canada. Um, HP sem summer schools, there was one, I believe it's Saskatchewan and then another one at UBC this summer, um, which are not discipline specific. They're just the basics of all kinds of HPC and how to use it. Um, group and individual training going, um, so this are sort of the data and software carpentry courses, um, some of that discipline, standard discipline specific customized training. So this is sort of software carpentry with, um, with humanities or, or social sciences um, 
specific data sets that'd be very useful. Training videos, online workshops like we're doing here. Um, again, the, the software carpentry teaching basic computational research skills. How do I how do I use the command line? What will that do for me? Why do I need it? Um, so lots of different training opportunities, both within regional consortia and nationally. Um, and, and the Westgrid website has loads of great resources for training on, on how to use everything. Um, so uh, go into some specifics on a, a couple of things that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, research data management, um, the partnership with um, CARL, which is the Canadian Association of Research Librarian, Libraries. So as, as data volumes grow and data storage is not enough, data management is really needed. Um, and as I said, the granting councils have published a statement on research data management principles. It was soon to become a major part of, of um, your funding application. Um, and so Compute Canada has partner, partnered with CARL, Canadian Association of Research Libraries, um, and with the support of others like Research Data Canada to, to address um, some, some of these gaps and to, to help make um, research data management easier uh, for Canadian researchers. So Compute Canada brings big storage, scalable data environment, and the software expertise. And CARL brings uh, metadata, curation, preservation, national on-campus support network, um, and provide research data management services, especially useful for long tail research. Um, and so we can help you with, oh my goodness, somebody's telling me I need a research data management plan. What does that mean? Um, we've got some tools that can help. Um, I also mentioned earlier uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So this is a partnership with the um, Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences um, and Compute Canada to, to support the development of Jupyter Hubs for Canadian researchers. Um, Jupyter allows you to do sophisticated programming through a nice web interface. So if just opening up a black box and typing things into it puts you off a little bit, because um, it can be a little intimidating for people who are not used to doing that. Um, Jupyter Notebooks is a really nice web interface. Um, it lowers the barrier to scientific programming and data analysis. Um, and it, it's very popular among researchers. These notebooks can be shared, they can be saved. You can do a lot of, of annotation so people know what in the world you're doing. Um, the current allocation could support around 8,000 users. So these are developing. Um, they're, I believe that they're institution specific. So this is the, the screenshot of the UBC one where I would have to sign on with my UBC um, login. So you would want to talk to your Westgrid or um, your Compute Canada person at your specific institution to find out how you can access this. So a little bit about some um, projects using uh, Compute Canada um, resources. So this is um, Voyant Tools, part of the um, Taper text analysis portal, um, which is uh, um, hosted by Compute. Oops, sorry, hosted by Compute Canada as uh, an RPP, and it's um, it's a whole bunch of really cool little tools that you can use to analyze your text. So you've got a chunk of text, you throw it in there. You click a couple of buttons and it'll do some analysis. This is a, a talk I gave um, uh, earlier. I can't quite remember when, which I just did a few things as sort of a word cloud and a quick, uh, um, quick collocations and, and some, uh, some nice graphs here to show um, freak word frequency. Um, and this is a very, very popular tool for, for text analysis. Um, with a lot of nice, easy tools to use. Um, there's the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory, which is a very large um, platform um, hosting large data sets um, that uh, it's, it's a data's infrastructure, really, the, the data sets um, for a massive amounts of textual information about Canadian writers and Canadian writing and the history of Canadian writing. Um, and this is another, uh, another example of, of a large web-based humanities project. But the back end of it is, um, is Compute Canada. 
Um, so these are the, those were two examples of, of RPPs, the big ones. Um, there's also smaller projects. This is a project uh, based at, at UBC um, and a number of other institutions called From the Ground Up. Um, and it's um, basically with this, tr with this project, it's training researchers to, um, to look at art historical and religious history from sort of a fieldwork archaeological perspective. And, and this group has been using own cloud in their fieldwork with um, photographs and descriptions and, and videos of, of religious sites across, um, across uh, Asia. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been working fairly well. Um, as with many of these tools, when you're using them for field work, you're very dependent on your internet access. Um, but, uh, but this is a nice project using one of our, one of our smaller, uh, quite useful tools. And that is it. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for attending. Um, if you have any more questions, um, get in touch. There's the, the team Humanities and Social Sciences at ComputeCanada.ca, and that will go to the team so that we can all kind of brainstorm and answer at the same time. Um, there's me on Twitter. Uh, I do check it, and I do respond. Um, and there's also um, Megan Dotlobe at UBC, and I'm very happy to have any other conversations to talk further about any of these resources um, and to just help you get started if you need. So thank you all very much, and I appreciate it. <laughs>